Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Happy to see that my dad and my stepmom made it here. Uh, appreciate you coming. Dad, this is more people than the first three churches you pastored together, I think. But, <laughs> but like that, they all sit in the back. Uh, nothing's changed from that. Well, I've been asked many times over the past few weeks, what exactly is an Omega Lecture? And I've considered describing the storyline portrayed by Richard Dreyfuss in the film Mr. Holland's Opus, but that musical explanation better fits my colleague Jeff Wright uh, that you'll hear from next, so I'll save that one for him. Instead, I've told people that this is my swan song. That's a term meaning a person's final public performance or professional activity before retirement. Or to be a bit musical with the swan song analogy, I hope that these are the sweet final sounds of a big dying bird, uh, but this time a raven rather than a swan. Now when Stephanie Leiter asked uh, those of us retiring from the faculty this year to give these Omega lectures, she noted that our allotted time would depend upon how many of us said yes. And my buddies Dave Baird and Chuck Kuntz both declined, so I thought that would mean Jeff and I would get about an hour each. Um, after all, after decades of teaching, we were pretty much calibrated to 50-minute lectures, but, uh, but Stephanie insists that our goal should be 20 minutes each, so let's see how that goes, okay? Have you noticed that on the high glass windows over the entrances to our Karnatsky Wellness Center, visitors are greeted with these words, a paraphrase of the first lines of the shorter Westminster Catechism. Our chief end, to glorify and enjoy God forever. Wellness, a means to that end. Well, with a little research, I learned that these sentiments come from the 17th century work of an assembly of English and Scottish church leaders, along with 30 laymen, all members of the two houses of parliament. And beginning on July 1st of the year 1643, this eclectic group was tasked by that governmental body to reform the Church of England. And over the next six years, they met in 1,163 sessions in London's Westminster Abbey. This was a, during a time of great national division, the English civil wars between the royalists and parliamentarians. Six years and over a thousand meetings, major national divisions over politics, culture, and religion. Sounds a bit like our life in the United States and sometimes on this campus today, doesn't it? But it also seems to me that the truths within these few lines from the product of those many meetings, first drafted to instruct British children in the foundations of Christian faith, they continue to be foundational to our work and service here at AU today. Glorifying God, enjoying Him both now and forevermore, living in a redeemed state of wellness just as our loving God intended for all of us from the very beginning. Now that Kardatsky Wellness Center, and especially the large Ward Field House, were constructed atop hallowed ground, at least hallowed to me. As you enter the field house and cross the six lanes of the indoor track, you'll find a wooden basketball court. And to your right, at the north end of that court, at the free throw line, someone needs to paint the words, Jerry Fox slept here. <laughs> that is the spot of my very first home on or around this campus. Now, 10 days ago, I had my 66th birthday. And except for 13 years with my parents as they pastored churches in Colorado, Kansas, and Illinois, I've been here on or around this campus for the remaining 53 years as a student, child of a student, staff member, or teacher. You see, back in 1957, long before there was a field house on that spot, that ground was occupied by a trailer court known by its occupants as the Haven. We had a haven before a place that we go to eat now. In the years following World War II, as older married students, many attending college on the GI Bill, came to campus with their families, some towed in their own housing 
House trailers, many of them smaller than the average weekend camper of today, filled that area with newlyweds and small children. I was just four months old when with a severely underpowered 49 Ford sedan and a barely sufficient trailer hitch, my dad and my mom, Jim and Edna Bentley Fox, pulled their small trailer home from Denver, Colorado to Anderson, and they parked it in the space that is now occupied by that free throw line. Together, they were answering their own calling to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. They came to study with faculty and staff and fellow students to better understand this life of wellness, wholeness, and redemption in Christ. Well, for the next three years, they studied part-time and they worked part-time, looking towards graduation day in early June of 1960. But on May 24 of that year, just weeks after my third birthday, in the middle of their final exams, and papers and class presentations, my life and theirs were forever interrupted in mostly good ways by the birth of another baby, now known to many of you as Dr. Timothy Fox, our professor of Spanish. Well, 15 years after that, I returned to campus as a freshman, and soon Tim did as well. In a few more years after that, my beautiful wife, Debbie Zarka, now Professor Deborah Miller Fox of our English department also joined us here. And each of us was answering our own sense of God's leading as students to study on this campus. I want you to think about this, that the Anderson Bible Training School was even born in 1917, that it later added liberal arts curriculum and professional programs to become Anderson College and then additional arts and sciences and graduate programs to become Anderson University. All of that with so few resources and encouragement is frankly a miracle. It's ridiculous to even envision it. But for God and the faithfulness of his people. The writers of the Proverbs tell us this. A man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. And also, trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight and smooth, removing the obstacles that block your way. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. We ignore these words at our peril. Okay, enough for my introduction. Stephanie, you can start my 20-minute time clock now. All right, well, over nearly four decades of teaching on this campus, there's a single foundational lesson which I've woven into the opening sessions of most of my classes. And in this, my Omega lecture, let me share that lesson one last time with all of you. Words. Words. Higher education is enabled, facilitated, and powered by the building blocks of words. Words by the thousands. We ask students to read them, write them, speak them, make presentations, be in discussions and debates. Words. It's words that carry and shape our ideas, our thoughts, our beliefs and values. And eventually, these words become flesh. They become our actions, actions which become our habits, habits which form our character and ultimately which shape our destiny. Words matter. Some estimates state that there are roughly one million words in the English language and about 170,000 of those are currently in use. Most well-educated English speakers use about 25,000 words over the course of their lifetime. And even counting those words is difficult. One of Webster's recent dictionaries shows 12 different meanings and uses of the word spelled P-O-S-T. How many of these do you regularly use? 
Post for mailing. Post, a soldier's assigned spot. Post, a position on a basketball court. Something holding up your fence railing. Words, they're hard. They're difficult. They're confusing. So think with me now. Of all these thousands of candidates, which would you say is the most powerful and, as a result of that power, potentially the most dangerous word of all? I ask students that question at the beginning of most classes. And they offer suggestions such as love, hate, forgiveness, and its antonym, unforgiveness, and more. All, all of these words are powerful indeed. But I contend that the most powerful word, the word with potential for both triumph and tragedy, the word at the center of what Holy Scripture describes as the two great turning points of all human history, is this word. Choose. Choose. What an amazing risk our Creator took when making humanity in His image. He gave us the powerful, dangerous freedom to choose. The first of these two great turning points of human history is described in the creation narrative of Genesis. The writer tells us that after God created our beautiful world, and then created humanity to enjoy it along with him, he then gave our first ancestors this risky gift of choice. They could choose to trust him and acknowledge his supremacy, wisdom, and love. Or, as their deceiver and ours whispers, they and we can each choose to ignore God's words. We can, as the proverb warned, lean on our own limited understanding. We can choose to be our own God, deciding for ourselves what is good and evil. But that choice separated them and us from the very one that fearfully and wonderfully made us and all that we see around us in this world. Human history indeed turned upon that choice that day, and it continues to turn as each new generation each new generation of students on this campus and each of us individually chooses daily in whom or in what we will place our trust. In his introduction to his modern paraphrase of scripture known as the message, writer Eugene Peterson also emphasizes the importance of words. He begins this way. As we read the Bible, we enter a new world of words and find ourselves in a conversation in which God has the first and last words. We soon realize that we're included in the conversation. God uses words to form us and bless us, to teach us and guide us, to forgive and ultimately save us. This is a world of revelation, God revealing to people just like us, men and women created in God's image, how God works and what is going on in this world in which we find ourselves. Later, Peterson explains that our first ancestors' choices, their responses to God's words, inevitably led to the fallen world that we live in today. He writes, this biblical world is decidedly not an ideal world, the kind we see advertised in travel posters. Suffering and injustice and ugliness are not purged from the world in which God works and loves and saves. Nothing is glossed over. God works patiently and deeply, but often in hidden ways, in the mess of our humanity and history. The Bible does not give us a predictable cause-effect world in which we plan our careers and secure our futures. It is not a dream world in which everything works out according to our adolescent expectations. There is pain and poverty and abuse at which we cry out to God in indignation. You can't let this happen. For most of us, it takes years and years and years to exchange our dream world for this real world. A world of grace and mercy, sacrifice and love, freedom to choose and joy. The God-saved world. A few years ago, AU's spiritual life and marketing teams 
endeavored to highlight our desire to point students to the possibilities of this God-saved world. They described the AU experience as real life transformed. In fact, those very words are on the wall outside President Pistol's office. Now that word transformed can follow our power word choose. And this leads us to that second great turning point in human history. But note, the possibility of transformation again pivots on our freedom to choose. As we experience the mess of our humanity, the things we study on this campus and encourage students to study for themselves, humanity with its suffering, injustice, poverty, and pain, which Peterson describes, we can choose or not to believe the message of the Christian gospel. The writer to the Hebrews begins his letter by contrasting the ways God has brought words of transformation throughout history. He says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. In Jesus, God again emphasized the power of words. As through the the Apostle John, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, remember choice, to those who believed in his name, again choice, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus himself said that as we face the uncertainty, the challenges, the possibilities that face us, that we can choose to trust him with our very lives. Again, through the Apostle John, Jesus tells us in this world, You're going to have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He invites us to choose faith, faith in him, rather than fear about our circumstances. And later, Jesus prays for his disciples and also for us. He says, my father, my prayer, father, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And so goes my favorite, most repeated lecture of the past 39 years. It's full of the central themes of that Westminster Catechism, living to glorify God and enjoy him forever choosing to believe his love and wisdom, choosing to accept his gift of forgiveness and new life in his work on the cross and the power of his resurrection, choosing to believe, as Jesus told his disciples and us, that the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent in Jesus' name, would be with us always and teach us all things and remind us of everything that he has said to us choosing to let our real lives be transformed to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now I want to end by being a bit personal. How did I come to hear and choose to believe this turning point lesson about human choices? It's all because of what God's been up to on this campus for 106 years now. I've already noted that besides myself, my parents, my brother, and my wife all studied here at Anderson, but that's only part of our family story. My mother's parents, my grandparents, also met here in 1919. Uh, My grandfather came from Northeast Ohio, my grandmother from Illinois. They both were in Old Main. He, as a student, she working in the Gospel Trumpet Company. Four of our six children that Debbie and I claim as our own have chosen to be a part of the fourth generation of our family to study here. Why do we keep coming back? 
And why would Debbie and I and my brother Tim and all of you choose to spend our lives working with young people on this campus to do with and for them what God did in our lives through faithful servants like each of you, my colleagues and friends? I'd like to close my comments today by giving tribute to just a few of my mentors over these 48 years since I arrived as a freshman. See how many of these names might also be on your list of giants along your path. This part might sound a bit like the Oscars when they begin playing the music to push speakers off stage as they try to thank everyone very quickly, but I'll, I'll do it as quickly as I can. Bear with me a bit. Robert Reardon and Robert Nicholson. Um, I'm going to pause for just a moment right there. I think I may be one of the few people that has been on this campus with all five of our presidents. Um, 1957, 58 school year was President Morrison's final year here. So I was here as a baby, but I was here with him. Louise Satanga and Gert Wunsch. Dick Young, Don Brandon, and Jim Mockholtz. Bill Reithmiller and Hillary Rice. Gus Jenega and Dr. James Earl Massey. I had them together for a Bible class. It was the best experience of my life, and I was too young to appreciate it as well as I should have. Marie Strong, Sid Guillen, Bob Bloom, H.L. and Sandy Baker, who continue to bless my life to this day. Norm Beard and Merle Stregge. From the Falls School of Business, all my chairs and deans over the years that I've been here, Glenn Falls, Harold Lineman, Ken Armstrong, Terry Truitt, Michael Collette, Lonnie Leeper, and all of my teaching colleagues over these years in both the Falls School of Business and across campus, too many to name, but one of them needs special mention. I'm a, and I'm going to make him cry, but I'll cry along with him. My dear friend and colleague, since the day in 1976, when he first arrived on campus, Dr. Doyle Lucas, we've literally circled the globe together, brother. You are loved. Literally every good thing in my 66 years of life has a link to this campus and the wonderful, faithful servants that God has placed here. So like Lou Gehrig in his farewell speech at Yankee Stadium, I can finish by saying, Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. And I want to thank each of you for making that so.